Good morning. It is a pleasure to invite you to this wonderful event in which we have as our webinar speaker this morning, Dr. David Anderson Hooker. Dr. Hooker is the founder and principal narrator for Counter Stories Consulting Incorporated. Counter Stories in engages as a conversation and visioning partner with international and local civic societies and also religious groups. Dr. Hooker is the former Assistant Attorney General for the state of Georgia. He is the author of The Little Book on Transformative Community Conferencing and co-author of Transforming Historical Harms. He has written several chapters and articles considering the mechanics and the results of multi-generational trauma, identity narratives, and restorative justice. He is a graduate of Morehouse College, Washington University in St. Louis, the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, the Emory University School of Law, the Candler School of Theology at Emory University and the University of Tilburg in the Netherlands where he completed his PhD. Dr. Hooker is also an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ. And please join me in welcoming Dr. Hooker, our webinar speaker this morning. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, thank you. Sandana, do me a favor. Do me a favor. Just yes. say one word about why this particular subject you thought might be interesting for this group. So I had the privilege of spending, it feels like you owe me some college credits for last summer of spending time over the fall with the Presbyterian Mission Agency and we called it the Leadership um, Initiative Group. I, I think I got lit wrong there, the acronym. But um, I also had the privilege of reading the book um, and learning about preferred narratives and dominant narratives. I thought it would be a, a really important for our Senate to hear more about how we tell stories and the impact of stories, those that we are conscious of and those that we are not conscious of and how they impact our ministries. And so I have not heard a, um, another person to address this in the way that you do Dr. Hooker and thought it would be important to introduce this to the Senate. I also wanna say that we are um, talking about how to lead change. And I am thrilled that although you're not a new voice, you are a new voice for many of us in looking at change management and how do we uh, lead transformation and all of those things. So we're about building capacity in the Synod of the Northeast. And thank you for being a part of our mission and our ministry today. Thank you. Perfect, that's, that's really helpful. Um, so we, the Presbytery Mission Agency, as it was trying to imagine itself into a new future, uh, pulled together what they called a leadership innovation team, right? And the leadership innovation team brought people from all over the country, but we also consulted with people in Canada and Africa and South America and the Caribbean and any number of other places to try and imagine a, a future for mission and mission agency particularly. And uh, Sandana was a, a really important voice in that. And uh, so I'm really glad to be uh, here in this conversation with you all. Um, I start off with this assessment or this assertion. I'm not sure that it's true, but it's the way I organize my life. So I'll just tell it to you. We live our lives in narrative form. Narratives shape our lives, um, conscious or unconsciously, we, we structure our lives by narratives. And I'm gonna make a distinction between story and narrative because I think it's really important for us to understand that. And for those who are 
interested in or concerned about the um, changing attraction of mainstream church. It, said, it, it has been said that mainstream churches are losing their resonance, they're losing um, their involvement, uh, or they, they are, the number of people who are involved and connected with mainstream churches is declining all the time. And my sense is what will be helpful is to create a compelling narrative of a shared future. How do we create a narrative, a preferred narrative of a shared future so that um, so that people feel like they want to live inside of it. So I want to spend time today just with us together talking about this idea of building a preferred narrative of a shared future. And that's a really specific way of thinking about how we go forward together. Uh, and so just a really quick uh, agenda, um, very brief agenda. I want by the end of our time together, um, I, I want to have introduced narrative theory as a framework for your action planning, as a framework for how you go forward, both in your organizational life, but also in maybe in your personal lives as well. <clears throat> and then we want to learn four steps for building a preferred narrative of a shared future. So there's a this is a streamlined presentation. There's a lot, lot more to it. But um, in order to do this, I just want to give you a little, little bit of social construction theory, just enough for you to have a sense of the underlying basis for narrative, and then a little basic narrative theory, right, to talk about why narratives matter in our life, um, and then quickly shift to introducing the process of building a preferred narrative of a shared future, right? Um, what we're not going to do in 90 minutes is necessarily learn the skills or the techniques associated with it. I'll talk about the steps, but we would want to spend more time to get facile, to get um, you know, acquainted with the actual techniques that we use in those four steps. That may be something that some of you would be interested in doing in the future. So let's get right to it because I think that 90 minutes will probably fly by. Um, social construction. These are just some basic frameworks. So social construction is not a unified theory. So it, it, many people approach it in a variety of different ways, but a lot of people who think and operate within a social constructionist framework would say they would agree that knowledge is sustained through social processes, which is to say that um, the way that things are known is by the way that they are shared with one another. Uh, storytelling and narrative are the most enduring uh, human technologies. We tell stories to pass down knowledge. We tell stories to share our lives. We tell stories, uh, and so, um, so, knowledge then is sustained. The way that you know something to be the case is it's passed down in social processes in a variety of ways. Um, Anti-essentialism is to suggest that um, there's no essence of a thing that isn't, uh, the meaning isn't constructed. Meaning is always constructed. So there's not a everything doesn't have like an essential essence, a, a one way of understanding it. I'll say that slightly differently again, but um, knowledge, this is really important, does not reflect a direct perception or representation of reality. There is a thing and then we make meaning of the thing and our knowledge is the transferred meaning making and not necessarily how we perceive reality or even that we perceive reality. And I'll, I'll build a little bit more on that um, in, in a little bit as well. And then um, this one is often tricky for uh, people who are um, people of faith when we say that nothing is inherently true. Hear me when I say it. I'm not saying that nothing is true. 
I'm saying that nothing is inherently true. What makes something true is that we organize our lives around it, that we operate within the reality of it. Um, and so it, it's not given as true. We make it true. Now, nothing is inherently true. And some of you may want to uh, test that in a little bit with me, but um, the narratives that we form, narratives frame all the systems, the structures, the policies, procedures, practices, nothing, systems, structures, policies, procedures, practices, relational patterns, none of that is organic and essential, like it can only happen one way. It happens in a particular way inside of narrative frame, right? In, because it conforms to a narrative. I'm gonna make a distinction between story and narrative in just a minute. Uh, but hold on to this idea that narratives frame systems, structures, policies, procedures. So let's try it. Let's play for just a second. You ready? Let's play. There is a narrative that says there, there was a narrative. I think it's shifting. I think in some quarters it still exists, but there was a narrative uh, that many of us were uh, in our formative years were, um, were developed by our identities were shaped with a narrative that says that boys don't play with dolls. I don't know how many of you heard that. Boys don't play with dolls, right? That was a narrative. When I say dolls, I wonder what comes to your mind, right? Um, <clears throat> Boys don't play with dolls, yeah? And so, you know, there are some basic dolls, there are some like cultural aspects to dolls. Um, then, you know, there's kind of a really standard, almost predominant vision of what a doll looks like. You know, Barbie is a doll, but Barbie was doll, right? That's why you say Barbie doll, right? Um, boys don't play with dolls. That's what we were told forever. I don't know if any of you heard that. So part of the narrative was the fear almost of the, um, of the kind of masculinity that a boy would adopt if in fact boys play with dolls. If boys become nurturing, boys become, you know, that, that's a different thing from a standard narrative of masculinity. But it turns out that if boys are around children playing with dolls, usually girls, boys will play with dolls. Boys do, boys play, right? And if, if they're around sisters and mothers and whomever that's playing with dolls, they will also play with dolls. And so to overcome this narrative, to, to, realign this narrative with another narrative about a particular form of masculinity that was being embedded. Because this is the thing about narratives is they're never just about the one thing that they're about. They connect a number of different stories. And so the narrative, the boys don't play with dolls was connected to a narrative about a particular kind of masculinity, right? And so in order to deal with that, we created an entire uh, category of dolls, <laughs> but they're action figures. And so we call them action figures. We don't actually call them dolls anymore. Um, boys play with these kinds of dolls. And as long as the dolls kill stuff, rescue, blow things up, you know, that kind of thing, as long as they have power for uh, destruction and mayhem and violence, um, then they actually are acceptable dolls for boys to play with. And so we can kind of we don't have to say boys don't play with dolls. We say girls play with dolls, boys play with action figures, which are actually just dolls that blow stuff up, right? But I, I hope you're noticing like how that narrative is in there, but let me make sure that you get it. So let me make this quick distinction between stories and narrative. And I wanna introduce one other concept, which is the narrative habitus. Um, Stories. Everybody knows what a story is. Children start, stories is 
the first developed technology that we get in the process of being human, right? Um, stories, we make meaning of our lives and we share our lives with others through the stories that we tell. The stories that we tell are actually shaped by narratives. Some of those are conscious, some of those are unconscious. Um, and then meaning is made and stories are shaped only by narratives that occupy our narrative habitus. So it's technical, but I wanna make sure we're getting this. So let's, let's lean in a little further on this and then I'll stop and make sure if you have any questions about these distinctions, because they get to be really important. So stories, you know what a story is. It's got a beginning, it's got an end, it's got an arc, it's got a plot, it's got characters. Generally, it's fairly specific, um, you know, and, and even stories told about the future are in some ways told in hindsight. Like you can't, you can't tell a story going forward. It's incomplete. You can only tell the part of the story that you've lived. And so stories are generally ways of recounting some history, even if it's a envisioned future history. Narratives, on the other hand, are the templates. <clears throat> they provide the form, the plot line for the stories that are told. So there are a bunch of different narratives. It's not like everybody has a singular narrative. We, we each have multiple narratives and multiple narrative streams that, that inform the way that we show up, the way that we make meaning. So, <clears throat> but narratives connect multiple stories. So for instance, if you have a friend, um, a family member, um, if you yourself have spent time, a period of time in your life living inside of what we would call a victim's narrative, that the narrative <clears throat> shapes, it gives the template, it gives the plot line. The plot line includes, I'm going to be victimized in every one of these settings, whoever is the victim, whoever's living in this victim's narrative. And so they can look into a circumstance that others may not be able to see it and they can find the data that supports how they're being victim. And you actually, if you, once you know that they live inside a victim's narrative, you can begin to hear the arc of their story and know that eventually victimness will be introduced as a plot line, you know? And, and victimsness almost always comes with a villain. So a villain would be a trope, right? Like who's the villain in my story? I, if I'm the victim, who's the villain? If I'm the hero, who's the goat, right? That kind of thing. So we know that narratives connect multiple, multiple stories. So the idea of a narrative, let me, let me show you how a narrative connects stories. Race is a narrative. Race is actually a meta narrative. It's a master narrative, but for our purposes right now, race is a narrative. So I'll tell you two quick stories. One, um, a woman wanted her child to have access to a better school. And so she was willing to pay the coach under the table uh, the the uh, crew coach, the coach of, of the crew in the rowing squad, um, to recruit their her child, her children to the school, even though her children don't row, but to recruit them on rowing scholarships. She was found out um, for this bribe, and in order to do it, she also had to fill out a bunch of federal forms, and so it was federal fraud. Um, she was found out, she was discovered, she was tried, and she was sentenced to 14 days in prison. And then she was released after 10 days for good behavior and because of the fear of pandemic. Another woman wanted her child to have access to a better school. And so she registered her child for a middle school using her aunt's address because her aunt lives in the district where there's a better school. The child actually spent the night during the week at the aunt's house so that they could get on the bus to go to the school. When this woman was found out, she was also tried and she was sentenced to five years in prison. 
She didn't pay any bribes. She didn't, she, one of the things that makes both of those stories that allows those two stories to hang together and both make sense in combination with one another is if race is introduced as a narrative, if race and class are introduced as narratives, then both of those stories make sense. And without really revealing any details, you can be fairly certain of what race the woman who got five years was and the woman who got 14 days was because race is a narrative and both of those make sense. Let me make sure that we're getting this though. Narrative is, narrative has a particular shape. So let me make sure we get this. I don't know, many of you probably did not grow up in cultures where Anansi the spider stories were told, but Anansi the spider was like a trickster in certain cultures. They tell a lot of stories based on the wisdom of Anansi the spider. So that one may be harder, but let me check. How many of you know the story of the little engine that could? Yeah. Um, can somebody just tell me what their, what's their take on the little engine that could, or what's the, what's the story? Just open your mic. No? As long as you keep trying, you'll get it. <laughs> okay, keep trying, you'll get it. Right. Uh, and the, the um, you know, the great mantra, I think I can, I think I can. I, I, I want to encourage you all to go back and read The Little Engine That Could. It was written as a girl's empowerment story. Um, the, the longer arc of the story, because we, the, we take the moral with us, exactly what you said, keep trying, you can. But the, it was a girl's empowerment story. The arc of the story is this, there were children on the other side of the mountain that needed to get their toys, right? And um, they asked the first train, the big gray engine, and he didn't have time. And they asked the second train, and he wasn't sure that he was able or that those were his children. They asked the third engine and she said, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. And because she thought she could, she did. So it's a great girl's empowerment story. But the other side of that, the flip side of that is, it was just embedded in there that the girl or the woman would be responsible for nurture of the children. Boys don't play with dolls. So the girl had to go, you know, take on the extra burden, the extra strain of making sure that children, even those not her own, um, would, would be nurtured and cared for and have, their, have the Christmas that they were supposed to have. So it's a girl's empowerment story with a little bit of a back backdrop. Um, the little, the, what's this one? What's this story? What's the meaning of this story? You mean the wolf one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't make any uh, false, <laughs> keep making false statements because people won't believe you after a while. Right. Right. What happens to the little boy? He calls Wolf and they believe him and then he does it again and they believe him. And after that, he's just a liar. But what happens to him? There really was one. And? He was not happy. I think, I don't remember whether he died or what happened. He gets, he gets consumed by the wolf when there actually is one. So yeah, okay. ch children's stories are designed to, to cause children to behave a certain way. They're teaching you how to be a good citizen. And so there are any number of children's stories where the end result is somebody gets killed. The child gets killed if they're lying, right? So that's the narrative. The way that we shape the narrative isn't just don't cry wolf but you get killed if you do, right? So that's the, back, that's the backdrop for those, for that story. Try one more. Um, ignore the fact that there probably were not European children or adults in uh, the Middle East when this thing was happening, but what, 
Does this image remind you of any particular story? David and Goliath. Yeah, and what's the what's the narrative of David and Goliath? With God, you can overcome a big thing that looks impossible. Giants will fall. Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. Donald Lawrence, giants will fall. So um, with God, you know, all things are possible. You can overcome. I don't know if any of you have actually read Malcolm Gladwell's take on this. Um, it changes the whole structure of the story. If, you, if you've never read Malcolm Gladwell's version of David and Goliath, it'd be really interesting to for you, see how, how it impacts your thinking about it. But there are things that we call David and Goliath stories, right? Because there's a narrative that shapes the arc, the narrative, the template, that's what narratives do. They give a template, they give a form, and then you tell the story inside of that form. Mm -hmm. That's the work of the narrative. It's how we organize our lives. We don't necessarily recognize it, but we organize our lives inside of narrative forms. Let me ask you this. Have any of you ever been surprised? Yeah, okay, most people have. Have any of you ever been disappointed? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So I would suggest that you're never actually disappointed or surprised based on the observations that you're making. Like what you're seeing, what you're hearing, um, what you're tasting isn't the cause of the surprise or disappointment. The actual source of the disappointment is the gap between the observation that you're making and the narrative that you have running in your head about the way that things should be, right? And so it's the narrative that is organizing your thinking. And then when you make an observation that doesn't align with that narrative, then there's often some emotional response to it, some surprise, some disappointment. In fact, I think for a lot of people who are disappointed with the church, it's because they have a narrative running in their head of what church is supposed to be. And then they get up in there and they show up at one of the business meetings, one of the sessions, you know, one of the session meetings or at a presbytery meeting or something like that, or even, you know, they hang out in the parking lot after church and they realize that the narrative that they have running in their head about this thing isn't aligned with um, what they're actually observing. And so there's a disappointment or there's a surprise or there's a frustration or something like that. All of those emotions exist in the gap between um, the emotion and the observation. Very few of you were probably having any emotion associated with turning on your computer, sitting down in front of your screen. Because the observations, right, were the same. They aligned with your expectation. The chair might be a little uncomfortable, but that's not so widely varying from your narrative that you had any emotion associated with it. If the chair collapsed, if the computer doesn't turn on, if when you turn it on, it starts telling you it's winding down and updating, all of those can be frustrating, surprising, disappointing because they don't align with the narrative that you have running in your head. We live our lives in narrative form. And some of those narratives are what we call master narratives. They become like a blueprint for everything. Um, they, they, they shape how we understand everything and they shape culture. They teach us how to be good people, how to belong inside of a particular culture. Uh, they often don't mention, every so often they do mention power, but um, they're, they're master narratives. So they shape all of our culture community stuff. And we find those master narratives in a bunch of places. They get uh, replayed and retold in movies, in children's stories, in our mythology, in our scriptures, uh, in our symbols, in our iconography, in our architecture, even in the way that history is told, 
we get these master narratives over and over and over again. And what master narratives do is shape how we think, how we act. So, uh, neuroscience, I'm starting at the bottom of this ladder. This is Chris Argerus's uh, ladder of inference, what he calls the ladder of inference. Um, the bottom is there's all kinds of observable data and experiences. We imagine it like a videotape, except it's really not. Um, because so many things are happening that we never notice that we don't record. Um, but the thing is, neuroscientists say that there are, at every given moment, there are 11 million bits of observable data available to us. At every given moment, there are 11 million bits of observable data. But we select, the most conscious people um, can attend to about 125 of them at a time. Out of the 11 million, we, we attend to about 125 of them at a time. Um, I'll give you two examples of this so you know what I'm saying. If, if, all, if you feel good, if you, you're not stiff, you don't have a headache, you don't have you know, a toothache, your stomach, you know, you're not having any digestive issues, you can concentrate on what's in front of you very differently than if one of those things is present. If you have a toothache, it's harder for you to concentrate on the data that's in front of you, right? Because the toothache itself is taking up data points. Um, uh, 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 another example that I think a lot of people will recognize, it, and some of you may have seen this, if you're driving down the street, if you're in your car, you're driving down the street, you have the radio on and you can't find an address, often what people will do when they can't find an address is they will turn down the music. Mm -hmm. have, you ever, have you ever done that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What does the music have to do with your vision? What it does is it's because we can only pay attention to about 125 data points, the most conscious of us, can only pay attention to about 125 data points at a time. And so if there's a song, if you know the lyrics, if you know the beat, if you know the melody, if that song takes you back to a different time in life, to a party that you were at or a relationship you were in, and if that relationship ended well or didn't end well, all of those things, that's seven to 10 data points. If you just take those out of your observable space in the moment, you can actually see the addresses on the buildings. The addresses have always been there. They didn't just appear when you turn down the music, but you can't concentrate. So we select which data we'll pay attention to out of all the data that's available. But the narratives that we're living in tell us where to look for data, which data is important. Then we add meaning to that data, we make assumptions about the meaning, we form beliefs, and then our actions are based on our beliefs. Regardless of what we say we believe, our actions show what we actually believe. Um, look at anybody's checkbook and tell me what they believe, right? Mm -hmm. And anybody's credit card statement, you, I can tell you what they believe and what's valuable to them. Just like in the church, right? The, the budget is a theological document. I can tell you by based on your budget what people believe. Mm -hmm. But what happens is those beliefs, then this is where the reflexive loop come in. The beliefs then determine what data we're going to look for. So we generally look for data that confirms what we already believe. So mm -hmm. all the other data about stuff we don't already believe gets um, pushed out, marginalized until it just breaks through, until it forces us either through surprise or disappointment or some other means, it forces us to pay attention to it. Our beliefs shape the data that we look at. This is all about our narratives because our narratives have embedded in them our beliefs. Our narratives are what we call sense makers. They distribute power. They embed morality. They allow us to make sense. They give us our own identity. Mm -hmm. What is our identity, right? Um, 
our narratives are sense makers. And so, so narratives, I did say I was gonna stop and let you guys ask some questions. I will, just a second, I promise. Um, community is fundamentally um, kind of, it's given by, Peter Block says, it's given form by the conversations that it holds with itself, by the stories, by the narratives that inform the, the structure. Uh, the, the, the narratives inform how things are supposed to go together. All the history that's told about a place, the way that buildings are done, the way that uh, geography is laid out, the economy, the infrastructure, all products of the narratives that the, the conversations uh, that shape the social fabric. And culture is the same way. Culture is best thought of in terms of kind of practices being held together by narratives. We do narratives, we have some rituals that are narratives uh, that reinforce narratives, but cultural narratives are embedded with morality, power, and force. Um, what, um, any aspect of your culture, for instance, we're going to come, we're going to spend a little time with this, but what does it mean? What are three ways of demonstrating that you're Presbyterian? How do you know? Cause that's in your, that's in the narrative. We're going to come back to that and play with that. Um, what are some things that people can do that annoy you or embarrass you or irritate you. That annoyance, that, that embarrassment, that irritation is because it's grinding up against, it's pushing up against the narrative that you have about what it means to be good or right or appropriate mm -hmm. in circumstances, right? Mm -hmm. In certain circumstances. So um, narratives are sense makers. And then the combined set of all of the narratives are our narrative habitus, like all of the narratives that shape and form, that occupy our way of being, that understand our, that shape our identity, are, um, are the narrative habitus. The narrative habitus are the stories, the narratives that we can understand that explain social class, religion, you know, race, all of those kinds of things. If somebody is telling you a story that doesn't align, it doesn't, it, it it's, not shaped by a narrative that exists in your narrative habitus, you can't understand it. Um, you won't understand it, which is why when some people talk about these days in modern times, when some people talk about systemic racism, because systemic racism doesn't exist in the narrative habitus of some, they can't make meaning of your story. It's not that they don't understand you or they don't want to understand you. They can't understand you because the notions, the, the ideas, the power, the plot line, the tropes that are embedded in stories about systemic racism aren't available to them. And so they can't, they actually cannot make meaning of the stories that you're telling. I hope you all get that. Let me let me stop for a second because we've gone through a lot quickly. Let me stop and see where we are in terms of questions, comments, concerns for this point. So there was one question in the chat that asked about worldviews. And let's see, I think it was Cherry Chapman. Cherry, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, this is really helpful for me because in the work that I do, I often say, it all begins with a story. And the question is, where is that story too small for your soul's longing? Yeah. And so this frame is just really helpful to what is the posture that we can hold our worldview, knowing that we all have perspectives mm -hmm. through which we view reality. So thank yeah. you. Just a really helpful frame. Good. So the thing about worldview, I actually try to, um, Siobhan, I didn't even know you were on here. Welcome. Good to see you. Um, um, the thing about worldview is as opposed to saying worldview, I say world viewing mm. because it is a dynamic process. We have, we don't have a fixed identity. Mm. 
We have multiple identity streams that create our being. And in certain moments, there's a, you know, there's a, con in every context, different aspects of our identity become salient, right? Like among my family, in my family, I generally don't have to worry about being a black man because so many of us are, right? So it's not, it's not prescient. So I don't think, I don't analyze necessarily through that lens, but in other contexts, my world viewing has to shift. So that part of my identity, which is always present, becomes what's salient, becomes the filter, the lens through which I shape my understanding, the lens through which I make meaning. So we have multiple narrative streams and world viewing is kind of that dynamic process where there are multiples of those. And so the question is often when people feel stuck, I ask them, is there another yeah. aspect? Is there another story? Imagine you've got a library with multiple stories available to you with multiple narrative. Is there a different one that you have access to that you can pull down that gives you the space to be who it is that you wanna be, to, to hear for your own the sound of the genuine, right? To, that's that's the thing that we're trying to get to. So thank you for that. That's the world viewing piece. I I have a comment. Um, yes, and th th I'm like Terry. This is very exciting uh, new information that I'm absorbing. I just moved recently to a new community very close to my old one. Uh -huh. Because I'm African American, I'm always wanting to know: Am I going to be comfortable here? What does it look like for me? And I haven't seen in my little part of the community, I know one third of the people in the, in the town are African-American, but I haven't seen any. I just see mm -hmm. white people. Mm -hmm. So I started driving around and what comforted me were Black Lives Matter signs, uh. which is in itself, I, I'm thinking a narrative. But I, I wondered who lived there. Right. I wondered what organizations they belong to. All sure. of this in this narrative that, that you're telling me is a narrative that I didn't know it was, but thank right. you. Right, and so so the, these are absolutely symbols that, that express particular aspects of a narrative, right? Like, mm -hmm. and so you're seeing those and that's what we're saying. So all of those cultural symbols and everything express different narratives. So you'll be surprised how many Black Lives Matter sign are, the, the people who have them in their yards will be surprising to you. Like when they start coming out of their doors, they're not all black folks, right? No, I know. It, right, and so you, and so that has, that for a lot of people that starts changing the way that they think. Mm -hmm. There used to be a time, I wonder for you all, what does it mean when somebody flies a really big American flag in front of their house? I think you're muted. You're muted, Barbara. You went mute. I think of Donald Trump, but that's just me. Okay. How do other people think about this American flag? Probably Republican. And it's aggressive because it's big. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Huh. That is so amazing because the flag was at one point supposed to represent a narrative of unity, right? E pluribus unum, we all out of, out of many come one, right? We, we form this one and, and over time, the one that gets formed squeezes out so many others, mm -hmm. right? It feels like the there's a there's a structure of who can belong and who doesn't belong to this flag, right? And so it's a way in which, and it really is interesting that the narrative has been in some ways co-opted. And so I've got you know friends who try to take it back by also flying the flag, and then you know seeing how people react to them. It's like that's interesting, you know, it because there is a, a co-opted narrative. What does it even mean to be Christian? When you hear somebody on the radio or on television and they say they are a Christian leader, there is a narrative of Christianity 
a, there's a dominant narrative of Christianity that doesn't necessarily account for inclusion or equity or uh, it, it, there. How did that happen? I, I differently, not how did that happen? How did you let that happen? It's your, this, this isn't like something, it's not organic. There wasn't a meeting that it was decided. You all, okay, that's not what we're supposed to be talking about. What other questions? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, you're echoing what I've been thinking about. I said, what are we Christians doing? Let these people say they're Christian when they're not. <laughs> they're saying everything that's anti-Christian. Yeah. Yeah. Where are we Christians? Why aren't we talking? Why? <laughs> And, and so, Barbara, I wonder what is the narrative when you say they're not like, how do you we, we form narratives and okay. inside of those narratives, there's a certain way of being and belonging. We have a certain morality. I, I form it by uh, Jesus saying that you love God, you love your neighbor as you love yourself. And the stuff that's going on is so hateful. It is not loving. And then in Micah 6, 8 says, what does God require of you? to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly. Right. Humbly is the right. next word with yeah. your God. And I don't see that. So it, it turns out, I, I love that you quote Jesus and Micah because neither one of them were Christians. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but we had to co op to them. <laughs> right. So, so we tried to co op a couple of poor Jewish kids and make their thing. And then we call it something else. And then we want other people to behave inside of our narrative. Anyway, so. Um, so I, I just have a question. It seems to me our narratives can both be conscious and unconscious. Mostly they're unconscious. And, right. And mostly they're unconscious. You know, I'm thinking about um, the book Cast and how that tried, yeah. how that wanted to bring to light a narrative that's so embedded in us yeah. and in our way of being. Right. So a question I have is how do we make narratives, how do we bring our narratives to light, particularly the ones we don't particularly like and are comfortable, and how do you change narratives? And so the very first thing that you do, which is our first step, how do you unveil the narratives? So the thing is, we operate in narratives, and we're going we're gonna to come to this, but let me just respond in the moment. We operate inside of narratives, but narratives that shape our actions, that shape our beliefs, that shape our thinking are so uh, habitual that they, that they inform us really quickly. In less than a millisecond, we start making meaning, right? And so in order to understand what the narratives are that are driving us, we have to slow down to be able to unveil them to say, this is, oh, why, why would that make sense to me? Why would I be surprised by that? What is it that I'm expecting here? And start noticing what those narratives are and noticing what are the myths and the metaphors, the, the scriptures that shape those narratives, and then figure out, like, that's one meaning. This is, uh, this is a slight digression, but um, there's a, a French philosopher that often gets misquoted. Uh, Michel Foucault you would write, um, knowledge slash power as one word. He writes knowledge slash power as one word. And people often read that. And when they read it, they say knowledge is power. They say knowledge is power. And what Foucault actually said is knowledge is the manifestation of power. Knowledge is the manifestation of power. We, um, we, knowledge is maintained in social processes, right? And so power, and there are multiple interpretations of what's going on, power determines which of those interpretations gets passed down with the imprimatur of truth. This is the struggle that we're having right now critical race theory, what you can teach about race, what you can talk about in terms of gender, what you can talk about in terms of what can be included in history or not included in history is because there is a struggle, there is a power struggle to determine um, what is the knowledge that gets passed down, what gets, which interpretations get an imprimatur of truth. 
And so anytime you try to incorporate previously hidden narratives, the narratives of the indigenous people who were displaced and, um, you know, and experienced genocide and the efforts at church-based uh, dehumanization. When we start trying to incorporate those back into our history, it makes people uncomfortable because our identities are shaped by a previously formed narrative that had certain power, had certain morality in it. And so when you're trying to change that narrative, people get uncomfortable. Um, so we're gonna spend a little more time playing with that, but let me just ask before I move on, what other questions, what if any other questions do people have about where we've been so far? All right, you ready to play? I can't see if hands have popped up. If you're using, I can't see everybody in my gallery view. So if you're using your electronic hand, then it'll pop up. So not seeing any of those. Um, I'll go, oh, here we go, Elizabeth. I was saying I was ready to move on, sorry about oh, that. Oh, perfect, okay, thank you. Elmo, we say that, Elmo, enough, let's move on, perfect. So, um, so here is my question for you. Um, Let's see, let's see, let's see. Which are you all seeing right now? Have the narrative, narrative have it is. Okay. So the question is, what is in the narrative habitus of Peace USA? You all are all Peace USA, so what are, I, I want to see if you get this, if I make sure you're getting this, because um, this is really important for, for how you begin to change it is to know what's there. So what is in the narrative habitus of Peace USA? I was going to go to um, breakouts, but I think I've gotten far enough behind on one of my digressions, one or more of my digressions. And so, <laughs> Shannon, you know how that works. So, um, so just tell me. Reformed, always reforming. Perfect. That's one. Absolutely. What else is part of this uh, in the narrative habitus? The book of order shapes the hymnal and the book of worship shape it, right? Um, decently and in order. Decently and in order. Absolutely. That they're a connectional church. Let me just try one of these confessions. We're, confess we're shrinking is actually part of the narrative. And so... Um, the question then becomes, does the narrative habitus, are the narratives that are making up the full story of Peace USA broad enough to include the people that you want to include, or in some way, do the narrative habitus actually have a way of excluding people? Like what in the narrative works to exclude particular people or populations. So educated leaders, is that part of the, Jessica, is that part of the narrative that were educated leaders, yeah. uh, white dominant English speaking? Yeah. So then what does that, who does that exclude? If that's part of the narrative, whether it's true or not, if it's part of the dominant narrative, who does it exclude? Yeah. I'm saying women and people. Can you say that again about what the, the, the narrative is? Because I, I hear it excluding people of color. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, and this is just my own history. I grew up, I spent, I spent, Grew up in Cincinnati, but I spent every summer in South Georgia, in Moultrie, Georgia, uh, the county seat of Colquitt County, the last hanging county in Georgia. And in Moultrie, there was a white Methodist church and a black Methodist church. And there was a white Baptist church and there was a black Baptist church. And there was a Presbyterian church. 
and you never had to say there was a white Presbyterian church because there was only white Presbyterian church. In my imagining, now I come to learn later that there were plenty of black Presbyterian churches, but in my imagining, Presbyterian actually meant mm -hmm. educated, upper class, white, and, you know, to some extent, uh, Confederate, right, uh, in South Georgia. Um, what? In Princeton, New Jersey, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it seems like it's up south, right? It's all over the all over the world that has some and 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 the thing is it's not always true i'm looking at the folks on this call and recognize that it's just not true but it's just such a dominant narrative that it's hard to move beyond it right yeah. how do you how do you get outside of that particular narrative yeah so that's part of our work is trying to figure out how do you get beyond a dominant narrative yes Word and information dominate over effective relationship with God, affective relationship with God. So that's the, that's the narrative habitus of um, Peace USA, right? Um, let me see if I can move you guys. So, let me introduce these four ideas because this is how we get to transformation. These four ideas help us to think about transformation. There is a dominant narrative. The dominant narrative we learn, we operate in consciously or unconsciously. Um, it upholds existing power dynamics. Boys don't play with dolls. Girls sit with cross legs. Girls pour the tea. Women manage the kitchen. Um, they support the church, but they don't lead in the church, right? Um, there are dominant narratives that celebrate certain ways of being and absolve groups who hold power or demonize and blame groups who are trying to sh reshape power dynamics, right? Um, those are dominant narratives. That's how we know they're dominant. They're dominating. Um, some of those dominant narratives create what we call a problem story. <clears throat> the problem story is, and Terry, I think this is what you were saying, people can't find the space for themselves for full flourishing, for a full life inside of the stricture of the dominant narrative. Can I find a place for myself inside of this dominant narrative? If I can't, a couple of things have to happen. Sometimes I leave to go to a different community or a different space where there are different dominating narratives, where there is a different dominant, where there's a different narrative habitus, where people understand my story. I'm gonna drive around in a new geographic space until I find somebody who um, has a Black Lives Matter sign so that I can believe that there might be somebody who understands my story, right? Um, because otherwise the problem story requires me either to conform to the dominant narrative or to accept that I am fatally flawed and try and exist inside of the dominant narrative, which is what has happened to a lot of people who are gender fluid or who have a lot of different, you know, who have a non-binary gender presentation. They, um, they experience the dominant narrative in many, in many churches as repressive. Mm -hmm. And then when people try to change that narrative in the church, that's when you see what you're seeing now in Methodism, what we've seen in the Episcopal Church, what we see in so many places is the division. People want to, as opposed to working through something, you want to separate yourself to only be with people who operate inside of the power structure that you've already imagined, inside of the morality that you've already imagined, um, and we create villains of the other. The the push against dominant narratives is to create a counter narrative, an equally viable narrative that resists the values and expectations of the dominant narrative that creates space. What are the narratives that create space for full flourishing, right? So we're trying to uncover those counter narratives. And then we look 
because those counter narratives are operating, those dominant narratives are operating, and then we have to choose a preferred set of narratives and then organize our lives inside of a preferred set of narratives, right? Um, so really briefly describing this process, and then we're gonna play with it for a while together. If you discover what are the dominant narratives of the session of the presbytery of the synod of the of PCSA of the larger church of the whole you know problem of christianity because it it sits in a nested way so presbyterianism sits within christianity which sits within uh challenges of gro global religion um but then the synod sits inside of that the presbytery sessions you know so it's nested inside of that so you can't always just choose your own narrative without acknowledging the dominant narratives that exist in the larger nestings, in the larger structures within which you exist. You can make some carve outs and we'll practice that. We'll see what that might look like. But first thing we do is begin to discover the dominant narratives and notice what it causes you to do. One of the things about a lot of people who recognize the problem of the dominant narrative is that you become successful, you become a leader by operating within the dominant narrative. You've learned how to, how to act, how to behave, how to, how to be within the dominant narrative. Even with the notion that you're resisting, you're also cooperating. And so you have to ask yourself, like, what are the things that I'm doing? How are these dominant narratives shaping my life in ways that I might otherwise choose or might choose differently? So understanding the dominant narrative, then understanding which parts of the dominant narrative occur as a problem story for whom? Because the dominant narrative isn't a problem story for everybody. If it was a problem story for everybody, somebody would change it. You know, people would cooperate to change it. It would be different but for the fact that it's not a problem for everybody. And so you got to know that going in. It's dominant because it's dominant, not because it, it was organic. It's not essential. It doesn't exist. Nothing is inherently true. It doesn't exist organically. It exists because social processes keep it alive. Where are the problem stories? And then between the problem story, the counter narratives, the dominant narrative, how do you choose a preferred, how do you actively name a preferred narrative and then organize your actions, uh, build an action plan and organize your actions in support of this new uh, preferred narrative, right? Um, and these are places that I look for, for transforming your life. You look for changing relationships, change resource distribution, change how structures work and testimonial authority. Who is it that you're listening to? Who is it that you give, whose voice um, resonates more, more boldly in your mind? That's how you shape your behaviors. And when you're changing, because the way that we live in narrative is habitual, we, we have to build new habits. You never break a habit. You can never break a habit. You can only replace one habit with another habit. And so the way that you replace habits is by changing relationships, by changing the distribution of resources, your time, your talent, your treasure, the thought, who has attention, who occupies space in your mind. That's changing the distribution of your resources. You change your habits by changing your relationships, your resources, structures, your relationship to structures or actual structures and testimonial authority, like who, whose voices are reigning in your head. And then you organize actions in, in preference or in advance of that new narrative. Discovering dominant narratives, understanding which parts are pro a problem story, uncovering counter narratives, and then choosing a preferred narrative. Now, this is the thing. The reason we talk about building a preferred narrative of a shared future is that often what people want to do is build a shared narrative of a future. 
And our work is not to build a shared narrative of a future. <clears throat> our work is to build a narrative of a shared future. Let me say that again, because it's sometimes, it's, it's a twist in there and sometimes we miss it. A shared narrative of a future would require us to agree on where we're going, on how we're getting there, on the direction, on the methods, on the way of being, on all of our relationships, resources, structures, testimonial authority. A shared narrative requires all of that be in some level of consensus or agreement. We're not trying to build a shared narrative of a future. We're trying to build a narrative of a shared future, a narrative in which we believe that everybody has the relationships, resources, structures, testimonial authority that they need to survive, thrive, to manifest their full capabilities and to contribute to a greater good. And the only time we have conflict is when your full flourishing and my full flourishing are impeding one another. Otherwise, we live together. We don't have conflict. Conflict is two ideas trying to share space. We create a space big enough that we all can live inside of it. We live, we go together in a narrative of a shared future. I'm equally committed to your full flourishing. I so want what I want that I'm willing to make sure you have everything that you need in order for me to have it. It's a narrative of a shared future. Let me stop, let's play. Thoughts, questions, comments, concerns. I think we only we don't have a lot, a lot of time, but we've got enough time to talk, to play. So let's play. Questions. How do you build trust in all of this? Because when we start to talk about um, trusting the narratives that we have been taught, uh, we're talking about unlearning narratives. Mm -hmm. How do we build trust and what does, how does that factor into um, what's being presented? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad. I always like, Lisa, I'm coming. Um, so um, trust, um, most people think of trust as a single thing, as, as, a, as, a, as an entity, as a thing in and of itself. And I think it's helpful to distinguish, to break up trust into a bundle of three things, because when you break it up into a bundle of three things, then you can start noticing how you build it. Trust is comprised of trust willingness, trust responsiveness, and trustworthiness. Trust willingness, am I willing to make myself vulnerable, interdependent in my going forward with another? Am I willing to take a risk to give some of my to, to depend in some way on someone else, someone else's performance, right? Trust responsiveness is um, when a person knows that you're trusting them, then they are responsive. They are motivated to do their very best in response to that. So just me trusting you isn't helpful. Me being willing to trust you isn't helpful if you're not motivated by that, if you're not motivated to do your best on behalf of the fact that I'm trusting you. And then there's a third component of it, which is trustworthiness. Do you actually have the capacity, the skill set, the resources to do what it is that I'm trusting you to do? Not everybody that you trust is trustworthy. So when I say in public that many times the police aren't trustworthy, that is not a judgmental statement. That is an assessment of their skill set. I do training in peace officer certification training programs. I know that they don't know how to de-escalate. I know that they don't know anything about how to deal with people who are having mental health issues. I know that they aren't trained. Their primary way of engaging is a relationality of force. They aren't worthy of the trust that we need to build community. In many instances, they are not trustworthy to, no matter how much we are willing to trust them and no matter how responsive they are. And so you build trust by little by little peeling the onion, extending a willingness, seeing how people are responsive to that and making sure that they have the capacity and the capabilities to be trusting. Do they have the capacity to, to respond to the thing for which they are being trusted? They're being entrusted. You know, when I was being, when my mother taught me how to cook, first thing she did was 
Dave, I'm going upstairs to watch the news. When the long hand is on the new, on 12, turn off the rice and corn and call everybody to dinner. After a little while, she could get me to put on the rice and corn and then stay here until it gets to the 12 and then turn it off. After a little while, she could get me to watch, do the chicken. And after a little while, she could send me to the grocery store and say, these are the five things we're gonna eat this week. Because over time, I became trustworthy, right? But you can't extend that trust to somebody until they've developed the capacity to be trustworthy. Lisa. I feel this is so out of time because I just loved everything you just said. Um, back what, before you, we, we broke into this, you said a sentence and I didn't catch all the words. Only The only time we have conflict is when your whatever disagrees with mine. What was the whatever? So conflict is two ideas trying to share space, right? Yes. So when your path for full flourishing impedes my path for full flourishing, then we have conflict. Otherwise, if I can fully flourish and you can fully flourish and we can do that together, we don't have any conflict, right? And so sometimes what we have to do is change the space. The book of order, the book of discipline is a space creating document. Sometimes in order for full flourishing to happen, we have to reconsider some aspects some constraints, some of the guardrails that exist within the book of discipline, within our, in order for others to be able to fully flourish, right? How do we do that in ways, if it doesn't impede your full flourishing, can we create a space that allows for me also to fully flourish? And if we've committed to a shared future, we have a preferred narrative of a shared future, then I'm going to do the work necessary to make sure that you also have the relationships, resources, structures that you need to fully flourish because we can't get to a shared future unless we both have what we need in order to fully flourish, right? Thank you so much for that. I loved it. <laughs> Questions, comments, concerns? <clears throat> Siobhan Starling Lewis, how are you? It's good to be with you and glad to sneak in. So my, one of my questions is along that thought process, how do we navigate people's un, un, where, unawareness of what it means for them to flourish? So sometimes poor boundaries exist in which folks assume they have to have everything in order to be flourishing. Or like how, yeah, it, it's the question of how do we, um, or, or the real question maybe for some siblings, I wonder, do they genuinely want everyone to flourish? Uh, yeah, well, there, there's a beginning place. The, and and so this is actually <clears throat> this is actually the greatest challenge that we're that we have and the church is the place to address it when identities are formed so there's a um, slight digression but it's directly related to this question there's a neuroscientist um, named David Rock right and he does a lot of experiments R O C K David Rock he has he has a a framework, SCARF, S-C-A-R-F, status, certainty, autonomy, relatedness, and fairness, SCARF, right? And so he does these tests. One of the tests that he does with children is he has these blocks of chocolate and the chocolate block breaks up into four smaller blocks. So the first time he gives one child three, he gives the other child one. The second time he gives one child three and the second child one. The third time he gives one child two and the other child two. The child who's used to getting three says that's not fair. Not because they will always have more than, if they keep this pattern up, they will always have more, but because their status has been questioned. They have developed an identity framed around having more than. They have and so when you build an identity that's based on a hierarchical, uh, in a hierarchical society, equity is threatening, is life-threatening. 
David Rock says that the, the places in the brain that light up when your status is challenged, when, and it's not that you lose anything, but if the other person comes up, that's a challenge in status. If, when your status is challenged, it has the same places, the same neurological response as if you had a gun to your head, a knife to your throat, or you see yourself driving off a cliff. It is actually life-threatening. And so we are inviting people into a space of death. Their life, their identities actually will die in order for equity to come about. Some people have said very clearly, I'm willing to die on this hill so there will be no equity. That's what we're watching right now. It's people who are saying, these folks are trying to come in. These people are trying to be included. These people are trying to be treated equally. I am willing to die on this hill. And I'm not, I'm not upset with them because I realize it's precarity. Their lives are actually threatened because they don't know who they'll be in a world in which that hierarchy doesn't exist. The work of the church is to create a vision in which people can't, that whole notion of no Jew, no Greek, no Gentile, no male, nor female, that whole, that, that there's not a substantial hierarchy or that the nature of your birth doesn't determine the likelihood of your flourishing. Your zip code isn't a pre predictor of your health, your lifespan, or your likelihood of going to jail. When that happens, some people's identities have to shift to the point where it's, it requires death. And so we have to be an identity hospice to allow them to die and a resurrection center to allow them to be reborn inside of the thing that they say that they want to do. You better preach. <laughs> and maybe in my, my, my hope is that the PCOS knows, A, knows that we can do that work. Like that is, that is, I actually think we're set up really well Right. to do it if we get out of our own fear yeah. and aren't afraid of our own shifting of our power in that right. same triggering way. But yeah. thank you but, for- But just know that, that power is distributed in narratives and sometimes it's morality mm -hmm. that um, is, the, is really the banner for power. Decent and in order, is a morality play, but it is a power play. If you are disrupting because you are coming in, offering a counter narrative that becomes disruptive, we have both uh, mechanisms, Robert's rules and other mechanisms for maintaining you behaving in a particular way. Decency and in order is a power play, which is not, even though it's supposed to be a moral statement, it is a power play. How do we disrupt that? I think Sabrina Slater also had a question about enough. Sabrina, would you like to raise your question? Thank you. It wasn't actually a question. It was sort of going off of what Siobhan had said and David responded with, but that question of like, how do people not know what would allow them to, th to thrive and flourish and um, us not enjoying it. Um, it's also a question of enough, like what is enough? Um, often it's much less than what we might want. We want sort of the comfort of more than enough, mm -hmm. uh, but what allows us often to thrive is actually enough. Mm -hmm. um, but another side conversation I was having with my buddy Frank here is that, um, David, you you sort of listed right um, name that we need to be hospice care for folks to live into a new life. But um, my first response to that is that we don't really like death and grief work, right? We don't, um, we don't like it. We're uncomfortable in it. And yet we still are bid to come and die, right? Like that's part of the narrative. That's part of the Christian narrative. Uh, but we don't like it, right? We are much more comfortable on Resurrection Sunday, or we prefer perhaps even just Easter Sunday um, uh -huh. as compared to Good Friday, right? But there's no Resurrection Sunday without Good Friday, yeah. but we're just uncomfortable there. Yeah, and, and I actually think, so a long time ago, it might be in the 80s, um, 
William Bridges in the 1980s, a guy named William Bridges wrote a small volume uh, called Transitions. It's still valuable. If you can find it in a used bookstore someplace, go and read William Bridges Transitions. The most brilliant insight, I think, is the first one, which is the first act in every transition is loss. The first thing that has to be accomplished for transition to happen is we have to, we have, to have a loss. And then the church, I think that William Bridges isn't talking to the church, but I think that the church has lost its capacity for, uh, Sabrina, for grieving, for lament, for, for lament as a aspect of our way of moving forward. We don't know anymore how to prepare the body. Uh, <laughs> woo! Um, <laughs> So if we don't have rituals for grieving, we don't have a way of moving towards transition. Question for you all. This is for everybody. Because race and racialized identities are so dominating in our sphere and our imagination, have you ever asked yourself, who would you be if you weren't white? What would you have to give up if you weren't black? The first transition is loss. And there's a lot, I gotta be honest, there's a lot of it, I'm not really, you know, there's some of the stuff I wanna hold on to, right? I like. I made it this far, I did okay. I, I, I kind of earned this, right? And so I want to hold on to it. But the question is, what of it do we have to live, do we have to be willing to let go of? Not all of it, certainly, but which aspects do we have to be willing to let go of? The power, the imagined hierarchy, the expectation, the narrative of different, the narrative of charity. Like I'm a good person person because there are those who are less than me and I can give to them. That ought to break our hearts every day. Like, um, how, do we, how do we move beyond those narratives to being um, aligned with um, recognizing ourselves among um, the least of these, right? Um, how do we do that together? Because uh, that first the first act in our transition. Once we've named our dominant narrative, we know where the dominant narrative creates problem stories, who is squeezed out, who is marginalized within. We seek to uncover counter narratives. Like what are the stories that they're telling themselves? What are the narratives that they use for survival, for resistance, for flourishing, even inside of dominant spaces and outside of dominant spaces? Where are the hush harbors that they go so that they can be who they are and be fully manifested in their capabilities. How do, you, how do we discover and then bring the Hush Harbor value into our being so that they don't have to go outside in order to be fully manifested? Once we know that, then we gotta choose. And it's always a choice. We say, of course we would choose this, but I'm not sure if it's always that we would, of course we would choose. We have to actively choose because when we choose, then we're also acknowledging that there's something we're gonna lose. How do we grieve the loss? How do we celebrate together? How do we reform identities that support equity, inclusion, full flourishing, and a shared future? That's the work that you're being invited to on a daily basis. And you know, thanks for stopping by and letting me participate with you in a conversation in pursuit of a preferred narrative of a shared future. Oh my goodness, would you join me in thanking Dr. Hooker? Well, I'm gonna ask you to go out and make disciples. I haven't had a chance to talk with Dr. Hooker about it, but stay tuned for part two. Um, we know that we would love to have more of this conversation. We want you to make disciples, talk about what you've learned today, and really uh, think about this personally and corporately. 
Um, what is God saying to you? I am what would be called full. My cup is running over. And um, boy, have I learned so much. I've got notes. I hope you have notes. Uh, we will be posting this particular video and we will be sharing with you part two um, very soon, the dates for that. Um, any closing words, Dr. Hooker? No, we live our lives in narratives and stories. Just choose one that allows both you and others to fully flourish and bump up, be willing to bump up against the systems that don't support the full flourishing of all. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. David, can you hold on? Okay. Are you still recording? Oh, a pause recording, Lori. We've got.